I'm sorry I'm so long-winded. <laughs> but some of this stuff, you know, it's so important, isn't it? And uh, you can get so easily confused because if you, if you bring one perspective, then people will say, uh, are you saying it's not important that we do all these things, health reform, all of those things? Uh, that's not what I'm saying, right? I always say, nobody will get to heaven for his right understanding of any doctrine. Nobody's going to go to heaven for having changed any one set of behaviors or theologies or anything for another set. Nobody's going to be saved because they keep the law and do good works. But nobody's going to be saved if they don't keep the law and don't do good works. So there's a balance. What I'm trying to say is my lifestyle is not my religion. Don't elevate it to a point of religion. It's not. Jesus Christ is our religion. It's not my business what Joe eats. And I was in a place, a very important meeting, and this man walks up to me, a high, high official, a representative of divisions. He says, are you Walter fight?" I said, yes. He says, I eat meat. Who cares? <laughs> right? Who cares? Go ahead. Eat meat. That's not my religion. If people see me as this, you know, vegan, vegetarian, carrot-looking, <laughs> lean, judgmental individual, they miss the point. Your lifestyle must be, I'm way off the track here. Get back to this here. <laughs> Final gathering. Thus says the Lord, keep ye judgment and do justice for my salvation is near to come and my righteousness to be revealed. Blessed is the man that doeth this and the son of man that lays hold on us and keeps the Sabbath from polluting it and keeping his hand from doing any evil. Yes, you're blessed when you do it, but if you do it to be saved, you're lost. Neither let the son of the stranger that has joined himself say, I'm separated. We know these texts. My house is a house of prayer. So the Sabbath is very important. The Sabbath is the center of God's law, was placed in the center of the ark in the center of the Holy of Holies, in the center of the priestly tribe, in the center of the camp of Israel. The Lord placed Israel in the center of the nations. This is all very central, but it doesn't save me. Jesus saves me. But it's very important that I do it because I'm saved. You know, people always want to know from me, how do you keep the Sabbath? How must I keep the Sabbath? I say, excuse me, I'm not the Talmud. What does the Bible say? If you call the Sabbath a delight. Excuse me, what's going on here? I never pushed anything. <laughs> Exit without sending by. Israel was often lax in Sabbath observing, and so will the antitype be. Isn't that so? And there's the quotes, far more sacredness is attached to the Sabbath than is given it by many professed Sabbath keepers. The Lord has been greatly dishonored by those who have not kept the Sabbath according to the commandment. I think the issue is reverence. But I do not want to define what reverence is. That's something between you and God. And each one of us is different and has a different relationship. Not everybody is exactly the same. Call the Sabbath a delight and the Lord's day honorable. The Sabbath is about a relationship, not do's and don'ts. But our God is not a buddy. 
He's awesome. He's awesome. So Israel experienced the midnight deliverance. Wasn't it at midnight? And the Advent movement, the midnight cry. Look at these beautiful parallels. Israel sang the song of Moses, and the final people will sing the song of Moses and the Lamb. Now, if they can sing the Mo song of Moses, they, that means they must have had a similar experience. They must have had a coming out. Why is it that we are so keen on a going in? What have we got to do with all the nations around us? Aren't we supposed to be a separate people? This is not a very comfortable message. But the fact that some of them have liaisons and do all of these things doesn't make my church Babylon. We will sing the song of Moses and the Lamb. That means the anti-type will not only understand the type of what happened to the children of Israel, but will see it in its greater context of salvation in Christ. And you know what? A prophetess led the children of Israel in singing the song of Moses. I have a sneaky feeling a resurrected prophetess will lead the final movement in song as well. Just a thought. Israel had with them a mixed multitude. The Adventist movement will have a mixed multitude. And the multitude were not only those who were actuated by faith in God of Israel, but also a far greater number were desired only to escape from the plagues. We have many in our ranks who are here because, wow, this, is, this sounds like something, and if I don't join this, I'm going to be in trouble. We have bread and fish Adventists. But that doesn't mean that a bread and fish Adventist can't change into someone who is on fire for the Lord. Isn't that right? Don't let growth confuse you or the lack of growth at a particular stage. So the mixed multitude that came up from the Israelites were a source of continual temptation. It will be the same with us. They were oftenest the ones to stir up strife. They were the ones to complain. They were the ones to leave in the camp with their idolatrous practices and the murmurings against God. And they murmured against Moses. So we will have people complaining against the anti-typical prophet, of course. After three days' journey, open complaints were heard. They originated with a mixed multitude. And they were dissatisfied, and dissatisfaction is contagious. And so often if someone snubs us or ticks us off, we leave the church. Why do them the favor? <laughs> True, eh? Yea, they despised the pleasant land. They believed not his word, but murmured in their tents. Have we got that in our church? Absolutely. Therefore he overthrew them in the wilderness. It doesn't pay to carry on. Idolatry at Sinai, we know all about this. They were impatient when Moses went up. And uh, they wanted to go to the land of promise, to the land of milk and honey, and here they were, camped. There were some who suggested a return to Egypt, but whether forward to Canaan or backward to Egypt, the masses of the people were determined not to wait for Moses anymore. As to this Moses, we do not know what became of him. And so they made this apostasy and they made uh, this lamb cold and cough and Israel clamored off the meat. The same will be true for the Advent movement. I eat meat. <laughs> the same person to try and shock me said, look what I bought. Look what I bought. This is for my martini. <laughs> Who cares if he drinks a martini? can drink a bottle of whiskey every night. Has it got anything to do with me? No, it's between him and God, isn't it? 
And I mustn't make it my business to make it my business to tell him that he's going to go to hell. <laughs> That's not my business. God's dealing with Israel. This is where it comes to the point. God in mercy called them out from the Egyptians that they might worship him without hindrance or restraint. He wrought for them in the way of miracles. He proved and tried them by bringing them into straight places. After the wonderful dealings of God with them and their deliverance, so many times they murmured when tried or proved by him. Their language was, Would to God we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt. Thus they lusted after the leeks and the onions there. Said the angel, Ye have done worse than they, talking about us. We're worse. Don't think they were stupid. We're exceptionally stupid. We also lust after all these things. And uh, to set some minds at rest, if we had to really practice the principles of health reform, not in a restrictive, oppressive, legalistic manner, but to really investigate the bounty that God has given us, we would never have a reason to complain. Because God in his mercy has given us everything that we need. Enjoy it. Don't make it a misery. So the mixed multitude hang around the outskirts and they complain. They had accompanied Israel from Egypt and they were not permitted to occupy the same quarters with the tribes. They were to be on the outskirts. So they can <laughs> from the outside. Do we have lots of... <laughs> Whatever. Going <laughs> from the outside, yes or no? Do you know, people, I want to tell you something exciting. These days I get attacked more by the conservatives than by the liberals. In fact, they're trying to outdo each other. And I figure if the blow comes from the left and the right, something must be okay. In Germany, I had a man run onto the stage from, you know, from the conservative... Uh, reformist movements. He was highly upset with what I was saying. But I'll say it again. Come here and suffer together with the people of God. Moses didn't separate himself. They were a burden, but he carried on with them. So who are the mixed multitude? They are the ones that lusted. Those are the ones that are the idolatrous. Those are the ones that eat and drink. Those are the ones that rise up to play. Those are the ones that commit fornication. And I can slip at any stage and be classified as such. They are the ones that tempt Christ. They are the ones that murmur. That's what the Bible tells us. They follow the Lord afar off. Didn't even the disciples follow Jesus to the cross afar off? Yes, we're all mixed multitude. Let's admit it. They are the multitude. Their lot is to be shaken up. So in other words, something must change in here. The tempestuous Peter inside of me must be subdued. Isn't that so? Do you love me? Do you agapeo me? Yes, Lord, you know I phileo you. I'm not capable of that love. Help me in my patheticness. Ezekiel, and I will bring you into the wilderness of the people and there I will plead with you face to face like I pleaded with your fathers in the wilderness. I will cause you to pass under the rod and I will bring you into the bond of the covenant and I will purge out from amongst you the rebels. Constantly this theme. God will take care of the church. I'm not the purger. It's true the straight testimony will cause the shaking. So we must preach what is right, but I'm not the purger. I'm not the one to choose who goes and who stays. Many are unconverted whose names are on the church book. 
Let these words be repeated by men who are consecrated to the work. God so loved the world that he gave, you know the text, his only begotten son. Let the sinner grasp, grasp this message as the word of God. Let him repeat it. I am sinful and polluted, but the wrath of God rested upon his divine son. As Luther said, when I look in the mirror, I see that I'm totally lost. And when I look at Jesus, I see that I am totally saved. Look and live. If God has given his only begotten son to die, the just for the unjust, he wants every voice to proclaim it. This is our message. Our message is not a judgmental message of you better eat right or you go straight to hell and you don't pass go and you don't collect 200 bucks. <laughs> now look at this. I love these Ah, I love the spirit of prophecy. It's so tangible. Whenever I read it, it rebukes me. I don't like that, but anyway. God will arouse his people. Please note this. God will arouse his people. If other means fail, heresies will come in amongst them, which will sift them, separating the chaff from the wheat. And God will permit permit heresy to become so blatant, so obvious, that everybody should be able to discern it. Will we have heresies amongst us, yes or no? Yes. Don't leave because of the heresies. Pray. Pray for your children. The time is not far distant when the test will come to every soul. The mark of the beast will be urged upon us. Then you will see how many will leave this church. They will run. If they're not rooted in Christ, they will run. True godliness will be clearly distinguished from the appearance and tinsel of it. Many a star that we have admired for its brilliancy will then go out in darkness. Don't look at the Doug Bachelor. Don't look at the water fight. Don't look at the whosoever. Look at Jesus. I could fall tomorrow. I fall every day. If you see me in my fallen state, what then? Are you going to leave the church? Good grief. <laughs> when trees without fruit are cut down as cucumbers of the ground, when multitudes of false brethren are distinguished from the true, then the hidden ones will be revealed to view and with Hosanna's range under the banner of Christ. I have sat in the worst meetings that you can imagine. I've come around in this church. I've sat in the highest echelons that I, that I lie in my bed and I, I want to die. And in the worst situations, there's always a gem. I've never been anywhere where God hasn't shown me gems. They are there. But remember when Elijah gave his great message there on Mount Carmel, the people answered him, not a word. But there were 7,000 that hadn't bowed the knee, but he just didn't see them. No one of us will ever receive the seal of God while our character has one spot or stain upon them. Now this leads many to claim absolute perfection. I can only be perfect in Christ. I'll never be perfect without him. Ellen White says, I can never attain to his perfect character. I could show you the quote. But when Christ looks at me or at you through the lens of his perfect righteousness, I can be perfect in my sphere as he is perfect in his sphere. Many people try to bring Jesus down to their level so that he is only the example, and when they reach that perfection, they can stand without a mediator. Have you heard that before? I better be sealed or else I'm gone. And the sealing comes from him, isn't that right? I can only be perfect in him. Whenever you look at the grammar 
of overcoming and striving, then it's always in the active process. But when it comes to Christ, it's always complete and fulfilled. It's very sobering to read it in the Greek. The Exodus movement was structured and ordered. There was order in the camp, and so the Advent movement must be structured and ordered. Isn't that so? Yes. God is a God of order. We can't just have a loose something or other. There's a structure. There's a great similarity between our history and that of the children of Israel. God led his people from Egypt into the wilderness where they could keep the law and obey his voice. And he structured them. I tell you, brethren, the Lord has an organized body through whom he will work. When anyone is drawing apart from the organized body of God's commandment-keeping people, when he begins to weigh the church in his own human scales and begins to pronounce judgments against them, then you may know that God is not pleading, leading him. He is on the wrong track. But I don't like the structure. I don't like the conference. It's apostate. Have you heard that? So what? This is still God's people. This is the body. And if there were apostate kings, and if there were non-apostate kings, it still remained the Israel of God. In the type, and so also in the anti-type. And God will Permit the leaders that we deserve. <laughs> Exodus thirteen eighteen. But God led the people about through the way of the wilderness of the Red Sea, and the children of Israel went up and harnessed out of the land of Egypt. God was leading. God was leading. Did God permit a Caiaphas at the right time? Yes or no? To fulfill his purposes. Absolutely. So the government of Israel was characterized by the most thorough organization. Moses stood as their visible leader by God's appointment to administer the law in his name. And so we have exactly the same thing. And the God has set some in the church, first apostles, secondary prophets. You know the verse in Corinthians. So the SDA church has a president corresponds to the position of Moses as the administrative head. It has division presidents, corresponds to the tribal princes of Israel. It has captains of thousands and fifties and tens, corresponds to the union's presidents, conference presidents, pastors and elders. And I'm a pastor in the Seventh-day Adventist church, and I'm an ordained minister by a conference and by a union and in a division of this great church church and that doesn't matter to me if all of them were to become apostate it would still be God's church and God would be permitting it to wake up his people Israel robbed God in tithes and offerings we rob God in tithes I won't pay my tithes to these people they're apostate have you heard that Yes, it happens. I'll give it to whom I think. Who does the tithe belong to? It belongs to God. Tithe belongs to God. Bring the tithe into the storehouse. That's where it belongs. And if they misappropriate it, they will have to give an account to God. The, part, the, the tithe is for the Levite. And if you withhold your tithe, the first Levite to go will be the one that you don't want to go. Because the majority might not be, you know, whatever, because you're withholding your tithe. So the Exodus movement was led by God, the pillar of cloud and the pillar of fire, and Christ was their protector. This church is led by God, irrespective of who he has permitted in the leadership. And leaders come and leaders go. And you do have your Manassas and you do have your Josiahs. And pray that we have more Josiahs. And did all drink the same spiritual drink for they drank of the spiritual rock that followed him. 
For he said, Surely they are my people, children that will not lie. So he was their savior. In all their affliction, he was affliction, afflicted. And the angel of his presence saved them. Jesus Christ is the leader of this movement. We must stop looking at all the individuals that irritate us. You can make it your business to look at all these people and you'll have no time for anything positive. Get over it. Go for a walk in the mountains. Say, Lord, this person irritates me to death. Please take this irritation from me. And then get on with your life and live the life and preach the message. Otherwise, you, my friend, you know who my friend is? That little man? Francie. Francie. I like him. He's always got, he, that man has got so much wisdom. I've seldom met a man with so much wisdom. He said to me, you can choose between two B's. You can either become better or you can become better. Choose. So choose between two B's tonight. What do you want to be? Better of the way they treat you or what they said or whatever or are you going to be better? Satan is now using every device in the sealing time to keep the minds of God people from the present truth. If you refuse and rebel, you will be devoured with the sword. Why do you want to be devoured by the sword? And be forgiving. Why is it so hard to forgive someone? Forgive that person. If you want Christ to forgive you, you must forgive them. So the Exodus movement was led out by a prophet, so the Advent movement must be led out by a prophet. Isn't that right? Why do we want to marginalize the prophet? By a prophet the Lord brought Israel out of Egypt, and by a prophet he was preserved. Moses was given a vision of Canaan, and the final deliverance before his death, Ellen White was given a vision of the heavenly Canaan, and the final deliverance before her death. Is that right? Beautiful parallels. Moses was meek and humble, Ellen White was meek and humble. In my next vision, I earnestly begged of the Lord that I must go and relate what he had shown to me. He would keep me from exaltation. Then he showed me that my prayer was answered and that if I should be in danger of exaltation, his hand would be laid upon me and I would be afflicted with sickness. Don't think the people that are often inflicted with sickness are necessarily under the curse. It could be the hand of God trying to keep them humble. If you deliver the messages faithfully and endure unto the end, you shall eat of the tree of the fruit, tree of life and drink of the water of the river of life. Moses was afraid to tell Israel that the Lord had appeared in him, and Ellen White was afraid to relate, relate her visions. Moses died on the borders of Canaan and wasn't able to go in, Ellen White. Could have gone in 1888, but she didn't go in. Moses received the message on health reform. Ellen White received the message on health reform. Moses wrote the Pentateuch to sustain the people of God on their journey. Ellen White wrote the testimonies to sustain the antitype. Israel rebelled against Moses. Do you think the antitype won't do the same? Remember, they will make it of non-effect. That doesn't mean take it away. It just means make it of non-effect. Oh, you can use it for homiletics. Devotional, perhaps. Exegesis, no. You can't use the prophet to say what the text means. Good grief. Those who enter paradise restored must retrace all the steps in rebellion and apostasy. We must learn to eat, dress, drink, act in harmony with our high calling. So things must change. I remember when I went to the Adventist church for the first time, having come out of atheism and Roman Catholicism, I was in a filthy jean and a t-shirt, because if I went to the Catholic church, that's how I went to church. And I said, nobody's going to change me. I'm going to be what I am. And that's how I went to church for the first time in the Adventist church. And they were all the fuddy duddies in suits. <laughs> and I looked at them and I said, Phew. and I came in my jeans and in my t-shirt. 
And then one day, I was called into the rector's office. Why? Because I had changed my views and I was no longer willing to preach evolution. And I knew, oh, I'm on the carpet. And I said to my wife, I've got nothing to wear to go to the rector. I, I don't have any clothes. I mean, I don't have a suit. I went and bought a suit to go and see the rector of the university. And the next time I went to church, it just hit me like a ton of bricks. You hypocrite. For the rector of an earthly institute, you go and put yourself in a Batman suit. But for the king of the universe, you go in filthy jeans and a t-shirt. So I changed my dress. But please, that's not telling everyone you better do it too. It's something between you and God, isn't it? It's my decision that when I address things publicly in the name of the Most High, I will try to dress appropriately. If you look at me at home, I look like a hobo. Doesn't Satan hate the testimonies? It says so here. Tyler Bunch wrote the Exodus and type and anti -tyke. He says Satan hates the testimony. Our success or failure as individuals or as a church depends upon our attitude towards the instruction given through this medium. Because the dragon was wrath with the woman that keeps the commandments and has the testimonies. The very last deception of Satan will be to make of non-effect the testimony of the Spirit of God. Not to take it away. That's too blatant. Make it of non-effect. Marginalize it. They're brilliant. When the testimonies which were once will believed are doubted and given up, Satan knows the deceived ones will not stop at this. The rot will go further. And if they can't get it right, then they will ridicule you. Some people, when they see me in Europe, they say, oh, the son of Ellen White. Derogatory statements like that. The poor people. Just because we have this great source, I've been shown that the spirit of the world is fast leavening the church. You're following in the same paths as did ancient Israel. They rebelled against Moses. If our church doesn't rebel against the spirit of prophecy, we're not fulfilling the antitype. So rejoice, we're rebelling against the spirit of prophecy. <laughs> I have been shown that unbelief in the testimonies has been steadily increasing as the people backslide from God. There are only a few like the stars in a tempestuous night shine here and there amongst the clouds. You can read all those thousands of pages against the spirit of prophecy and be totally confused. You can also choose to load down on the web pages all the contradictions in the Bible and you'll never believe the Bible again unless you also download the careful answers to all those supposed contradictions. Balance it by their fruits. If this church doesn't have a prophet, it's not God's church. What we need is a revival of true godliness amongst us. And this is the greatest and most urgent of our needs. To seek this should be our first work. The time has come for a thorough reformation to take place. <clears throat> when this reformation begins, the spirit of prayer will actuate every believer and will banish from the church the spirit of discord and strife. We started off with... That request from the young pastor who stood on the front here today. Why not end with this? A revival and a reformation must take place under the ministration of the Holy Spirit. Revival and reformation are two different things. Revival signifies a renewal of spiritual life, a quickening of the powers of the mind and heart, and resurrection from spiritual death. Reformation signifies a reorganization, a change in ideas and theories. Put away the unbelief. Incorporate belief. Put away the bad lifestyle. Ask the Lord, Lord, I want to live a better life. Show me how I can do it and enjoy it. 
Warnings from the experience of Israel. The religion of many of us will be the religion of apostate Israel because they love their own way and forsake the way of the Lord. I'm going to skip some of these because we don't have time for all of this. So at Marah, the Lord showed Moses a tree which when cast into the waters made it sweet. The Advent movement of the great disappointment of 1844 was given a reed like unto a rod to measure the sanctuary. In the sanctuary truth, the key to sweet waters was found. It was bitter and it was sweet. The parallels are just unbelievable. I'm not going to go through all the texts. From Marah to Sinai, Israel was taken directly from their disappointment to the solemnity of Sinai. So the Advent movement went from their bitter disappointment to the anti-typical Sinai, and they discovered the law, and it was the law, 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 the law. But what else were they given at Sinai? The sanctuary, the sanctuary, the sanctuary, the sanctuary. But they ran with the law. And so the Advent movement did exactly the same thing. So the law alone brings only condemnation. Without the sanctuary, there's no salvation. At the foot of Mount Sinai, God gave Moses the sanctuary vision. Similarly, Ellen White was given the great sanctuary vision after the great disappointment. How dare we throw the sanctuary out? If we don't have it, we're not the antitype and we don't have the gospel. The law and righteousness by faith go together. The efficacy of Christ frees us from the condemnation of the law. It imputes and imparts his righteousness unmerited by us and restores the broken relationship with God. Isn't that correct? So the early Advent movement brought out this poster and there was the law in the middle. This was the way of life from paradise lost to paradise restored, 1876. And eventually they realized, well, they didn't go into Canaan in 1888 because they rejected the righteousness by faith message. Do you know what? They still got it confused. Eventually they decided, well, let's put less emphasis on the law and they think they got it right. In 1883, they put Jesus in the middle. Is this now an improvement? <laughs> now you're stumme. They answered him not a word. <laughs> I have a question. Can you separate the character of God from God? No. This is also wrong. Satan is so brilliant. He can't, if he can't get you to be a legalist, he'll get you to preach grace without law. As long as you don't have them both, he's happy. He was happy that the Jews kept the law and got rid of Christ. And he's perfectly happy that the Christians love Jesus and ignore the law. If he can do the same in the Adventist church, and do we have this going on in our church, yes or no? We're a boat. Remember those narrow boats where you sit in and you row and somebody gets legalistic and he builds a plank and he starts climbing out of the boat this way and the boat starts going <coughs> and to balance the boat someone builds a plank that way and climbs out and sits over there where the belt is bowlimps. Then the next one climbs up, and eventually there's nobody in the boat. They're all sitting on planks over there. Please get back into the boat. <laughs> this is Christ, the way of life in 1980. So they've just added color, but nothing's changed. I would like to see it like that. I would like to see Christ and the law superimposed. Because the character of God and the character of the law are identical. I cannot separate the law from Christ. We as an Advent people, 
must be people of the book, we must be people of the law, but we must realize that without Christ, our laws mean nothing. We need the two of them together. Behold, the days come, says the Lord, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, with my covenant, which my covenant they break, although I was a husband unto them, says the Lord. But this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law in their inward parts. Comes part of you. That's imputed righteousness. And write it in their hearts and will be their God and they shall be my people. Hebrews says, For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws in their mind and write it in their hearts, and I will be with them a God, and they shall be to me a people. This movement is a movement of destiny. With all its faults, with all its apostasy, with all its mixed multitude, with all its tears, with all its chaos, there's no other movement that will follow it. There's no coming out. There's only a spitting out. Hang in there. We're going home. Stay in the movement. I'll be giving lectures on the situation within the church, and you will see that it's, it's bad. But when I give those lectures, don't think that I'm being judgmental. I'm just portraying the facts and showing you we really are like Israel of old. Just better. We've perfected it. <laughs> but this is God's final movement. And you are either in the ark or you are in the water. Choose. May God bless us. Amen. Amen.